Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We were speaking about at tasalsul of the attributes of Allah Jalla wa'ala and we mentioned the three madhahib. The first madhahib saying that at tasalsul in the attributes of Allah is not past eternal and neither is it future eternal. So in other words, Allah Jalla wa'ala did not have his characteristics eternally in the past and he will not continue eternally in the future to have his characteristics. This is the madhab of the Jahmiya and some of the Mu'tazila. The second madhab of the Asha'ira is that Allah Jalla wa'ala did not have his characteristics eternally in the past but he will have them eternally in the future. So in other words, there was a point in time or maybe even before time as we know it that the characteristics of Allah began to exist. So in other words, for a long stretch of time, Allah Jalla wa'ala was not the creator because he had not created anything. And then the third madhab of Ahl Sunnah is that his characteristics, just like Allah Jalla wa'ala himself, his essence, stretch eternally in the past and eternally in the future. So that there was never a time when Allah Jalla wa'ala was not creating. And likewise with all of his other characteristics. So we say his characteristics are past eternal and future eternal when it comes to his sifa dhatiya, both the khabariya and ma'nawiya, which we have discussed before, but also his sifa fi'liya in the general sense, meaning the jints of it, the type of it. So to explain this, his speech is a sifa fi'liya, he does it when he wills it. So for example, when he said to the fire, Ya nar, kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. He uttered these words at a particular point in time. He was not always past eternally uttering these words. Rather, he uttered them for the first time at some point in time, when of course Ibrahim was cast into the fire. So the individual items of his speech can come about anew. This is the view of Ahl Sunnah. However, the jinsul kalam, the actual act of speaking, that is past eternal so that he was always speaking. Now what about at tasalsul when it comes to the creation? The creation going on for an eternity in the past. So for example, this universe, this is the creation. There are many other creations of Allah Jalla wa ala before this universe. Of course, we know that must be the case. We just don't know what these creations are. But let's take this universe. This universe, did it go on eternally in the past? This is an impossible thought according to most of mankind. And this has been the case for a very, very long time. The vast majority of the people, even if they did not have any scientific data, did not believe that this universe went on in the past eternally. Of course, some philosophers did. They said that there is no universe except this universe which has gone on forever. What about the tasalsul in the future though? Well, this is possible according to most of the schools of thought within the Muslims. So this is simply to say that Allah Jalla wa'ala can create a particular creation that lasts forever. There is another discussion point which is about cause and effect. Now there are two contrasting opinions here. The first madhab says that there is no cause and effect. They simply say that Allah Jalla wa'ala creates everything. So if for example a hammer, you smash a hammer onto a glass and the glass shatters. They say that the hammer did not cause the glass to shatter. Rather Allah Jalla wa'ala created the shattering of the glass at the point of impact of the hammer. Or for example, when the rain hits the ground, the crops grow. They say that Allah Jalla wa'ala made the crops grow at the point of impact of the rain hitting the ground. This is the opinion held by the Asha'ira, the Qadariya, those who deny the Qadr, and others besides. Their reasoning is that if you affirm an illa, a cause for something, then you're actually affirming a creator besides Allah. Because it's as if you're saying that this cause created that particular effect, the crops growing or the glass shattering and so on. And that would be shirk. The contrasting opinion to that is to say the cause does have an effect. So the hammer does cause the glass to shatter. So without the hammer, the glass would not just shatter by itself. However, both the cause and the effect are a creation of Allah Jalla wa'ala. 
So it's like saying that Allah has created in the cause the ability to produce the effect. So, for example, Allah has created in the hammer the ability to shatter the glass. Or for example, He has created in the rainwater the ability to cause the crop growth. So this cause and effect is not just happening by its own self. Rather, it is because Allah has created in the cause the ability to produce the effect. If we take a look at Ibrahim السلام, when he was thrown into the fire, he was not burnt as the famous story goes. We know the fire has the ability to burn. That's what fire does. It burns. And in particular, the human flesh and skin, it will burn it. Now, the first madhab, which we have just mentioned out of the two, will say, look, this proves our point. The fire did not burn Ibrahim السلام. How come? Because Allah Jalla wa ala did not create that burning. It just goes to show that the fire had no effect, meaning to say the cause does not produce the end effect. Rather, it is Allah who produces the end effect at the point of impact of the cause. However, this episode can also be used as evidence by the second madhab, which says that the cause does have an impact, it does produce the effect, but here the fire did not burn Ibrahim السلام, because Allah Jalla wa ala intervened. As he said, Kuni bardam wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Had Allah Jalla wa ala not intervened, the fire would have burnt Ibrahim السلام. And no doubt, the second madhab is the correct opinion here. Allah Jalla wa ala creates the cause and effect. He produces in the cause the ability to produce the effect. And it is all a creation of Allah. So this is how we avoid the shirk. When we say that both the cause and effect are a creation of Allah Jalla wa ala, because Allah creates in the cause the ability to produce the effect. So in other words, we have only affirmed one creator and not two creators. So without a doubt, this second opinion is the correct and balanced opinion. And this is the sunnah of Allah Jalla wa ala. He creates the causes and produces in the cause the ability to produce the effect. And without Allah Jalla wa ala, the cause cannot produce the desired effect. The fire cannot produce the ability to burn. And the hammer will not be able to produce the ability to shatter the glass. And so on. So these causes are a creation of Allah Jalla wa ala, And he puts in these causes the ability to produce the effect. So we have only affirmed one creator. Okay, the next talking point. The Shaykh says... As he was in his attributes, azali, without beginning, like that then, he will be without end in his attributes. Definitely, this is a statement of truth, and it is what the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah affirm. The important point here is this letter ba, bi sifatihi, with his descriptions. The Mu'tazila and others, they translate the ba to wow, wa meaning and. So Allah and his descriptions were without beginning because they separate Allah Jalla wa ala from his descriptions. And so the descriptions were not always with Allah Jalla wa ala. The next point to discuss is the statement of the Shaykh ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ That is because he is able to do everything وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ إِلَيْهِ فَقِيرٍ And everything else is needy of Allah, وَكُلُّ أَمْرٍ عَلَيْهِ يَسِيرٍ And everything is easy for him to do. لا يحتاج إلى شيء. He is in need of nothing. ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير. There is nothing of his description, and he is the hearer, the seer. So pay attention to these words that Allah is able to do everything. And there are many ayat in the Quran which prove this point. The people of Bida say that the qudra, the ability of Allah, only pertains to that which He wills. So they say that Allah is able to do what He wills. They do not say Allah is able to do everything. So if you ask them, is Allah able to make Iblis not exist? So put him out of existence. They will say, no, He is not able to do that. What about putting the heavens out of existence? No, He is not able to do that. Why? Because the ability of Allah Jalla wa ala, they say, is only pertaining to what he wills. And so that which he does not will in the universe, in his creation, then the ability of Allah does not pertain to that. 
So we know, for example, that Iblis exists. That means that Allah willed Iblis to exist. And so they say that Allah is able to do what he wills, and he wills Iblis to exist, which basically means that he did not will Iblis not to exist, just taking the converse of that. So if he did not will Iblis not to exist, and they say that the ability of Allah is pertaining to his will, then that means that Allah is not able to make Iblis not exist. And likewise, future events, that which Allah should will, it should not exist in the future, then Allah is unable to produce that thing in the future. Why? Because he did not will for it to exist or to come to pass. And the reason why this opinion is wrong is because it directly contradicts the Qur'an. The Qur'an links the Qudra of Allah Jalla wa ala to kullu shay, everything. Now everything includes that which Allah wills and that which Allah does not will. So that was the general evidence which includes everything. But we have a yet more specific evidence in Surah Al-An'am where he says قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابًا مِّنْ فَوْقِكُمْ أو من تحت أرجلكم أو يلبسكم شيعا ويذيق بعضكم بأس بعض. Say he is able to send down a punishment on you from above or from beneath your feet or to cause confusion amongst you in party strife. So you have one group arguing against the other group and it's all confusion. Who is right? Who is wrong? We don't know. Everything's a confusion. And he says to make you taste the violence of one another. So different parties fighting each other. And he finishes the ayah, Unzur, كَيْفَ نُصَرِّفُ الْآيَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَفْقَهُونَ So see how variously we explain the signs that they may understand. Now the point here being that Allah Jalla wa ala did not punish the Ummah from a punishment above them or from beneath their feet, such that he would completely wipe them out. However, he did cause inter-party strife between the Muslims and we have plenty of examples of that. Anyway, the point being is that Allah says he's able to do something which he did not will. Now we do find in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, Allah saying, Inni ala ma asha'u qadir. Verily, I am able to do what I will. And this could be used as evidence from the people of Bid'ah saying that the Qudra of Allah is pertaining to his will. We say yes, it's pertaining to his will, but just because in the hadith it says it pertains to his will doesn't mean that it does not pertain to that which he does not will. As the ayah in Surah Al-An'am which we have quoted proves that his qudra pertains to those things which he does not will. Then the shaykh goes on to say, خَلَقَ الْخَلْقَ بِعُلْمِهِ وَقَدَّرَ لَهُمْ أَقْدَارًا So he says that he created the creation with his knowledge. So we say that everything that Allah Jalla wa ala does it is with his knowledge, it is always with him. It is his continuous and constant attribute. So when he creates, it is with knowledge. When he is able to do something, it is with knowledge. When he is merciful to someone, it is with knowledge. So this attribute of knowledge is always with him, never separated from him. The extremists of the Qadariya, they deny the knowledge of Allah Jalla wa ala. They say that Allah does not know what will happen in the future. And there did used to be people like that. And they argued their point by saying that Allah, for example, says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, So that Allah may know who fears him in the unseen. So in other words, Allah does not know who fears him in the unseen, but he will test them so that he will know who fears him in the unseen. Or for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولَ مِمَّنْ يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ أَقِبَيْهِ And we did not appoint this Qibla which you were upon except that we may know who will follow the Messenger and who will turn back on his heels. So Allah again is testing them to see who will follow. In other words, before the test, Allah did not know who will follow him and who will not. And then there are many other such ayat which give off this same message. However, the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah simply say that when Allah says that he may know who will follow the Messenger, then this type of knowledge is the one from which reward or punishment results. As for his knowledge before, then reward or punishment cannot result from it. If a teacher, for example, knows that the student is going to fail the exams, the teacher has no right to give a fail mark to the student before the student takes the exam. 
It's only after the student takes the exam and fails it that the teacher can give a fail mark, because then the teacher will be justified in giving the fail mark. And so likewise then is the knowledge of Allah. He knows who is going to follow the messenger and who will turn back on his heels, but reward and punishment cannot result from that, because you cannot reward or punish a person before they have done the particular action from which reward or punishment results. So in the ayah, Allah Jalla wa ala made the Qibla as Baytul Maqdis and he did this so that when the Qibla is going to be changed from Baytul Maqdis to the Kaaba, then who will follow the messenger and who will turn back on his heels? This is the test. Allah knows that already, but reward or punishment cannot result from Allah's antecedent knowledge. It can only result from Allah's subsequent knowledge. And here we can say there are two types of knowledge, antecedent knowledge and subsequent knowledge. So the antecedent knowledge is knowledge before an event takes place and subsequent knowledge is knowledge after the event takes place. So for example, you know the sun is going to rise tomorrow. This is your antecedent knowledge. Then when tomorrow comes and the sun has risen and you know that the sun has risen, then again you have knowledge that the sun has risen, but this is your subsequent knowledge. So knowledge after the event. And so these are two types of knowledge. But that leaves us with the question, what is the evidence that Allah Jalla wa ala knows things before they will happen? Well, he knows, for example, when Yawm Al-Qiyamah will be. Qul innama ilmuha indallah. Say the knowledge of it is with Allah, meaning of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That hasn't happened yet, but Allah knows it before it will happen. And in Surah Al-Hadid, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ No calamity befalls the earth, nor in your own selves, except that it is in a book, meaning written down, before we bring it into existence, verily that is easy for Allah. So he knows and has written down all the calamities which will take place. And we say that Allah Jalla wa ala is always with his knowledge, because the Mu'tazila, for example, they say that Allah is knowledgeable without knowledge. He is living without life. He is the creator without the attribute of creation. So you see, they strip Allah Jalla wa ala of his attributes. That is, attributes are not part of him or always with him. They say that knowledge has individual elements of knowledge. So after every new event, new knowledge is formed. So after every new creation, Allah has knowledge of that creation. So they say it's as if a new attribute of Allah Jalla wa ala of knowledge is produced with every individual item of knowledge. So it's as if Allah Jalla wa ala gains in knowledge. And you cannot have any point in time in which new knowledge for Allah Jalla wa ala is formed. But of course, like we say, there are two types of knowledge, the antecedent knowledge and the subsequent knowledge. Yes, the subsequent knowledge can only happen after the event takes place. So that was not always in existence. However, the antecedent knowledge was always in existence with Allah Jalla wa ala. And as we read, the Shaykh goes on to say, وَقَدَّرَ لَهُمْ أَقْدَارًا And he decreed the matters for his creation. Allah Jalla wa ala says in Surah Al-Furqan, وَخَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَقَدَّرَهُ تَقْدِيرًا And he created everything and he gave it a decree. Likewise, he's saying, وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَذَا The one who decreed and then guided. So as for his statement, وَقَدَّرَ لَهُمْ أَقْدَارًا And he decreed for them the matters. It means to say that this creation of Allah Jalla wa ala, nothing happens to it except that it has been decreed for it. And to give some detail on this, we can divide it up into categories. So when everything has been decreed for Allah's creation, then the type of things this includes is, first of all, your actual creation itself. You see that the birds are created one way, the ants are created another way, the lion is created a completely different way, and so on. We take a look at the embryo. It is developed in stages. It will never leave the belly of its mother, except it has already decreed for it the stages which it will have to pass through, and any deficiencies which this embryo will suffer, or whether it will be free from any deficiency or any excess. In Surah Al-Ra'd, Allah Jalla wa ala tells us, Allah يَعْلَمُ مَا تَحْمِلُ كُلُّ أُنْثَى وَمَا تَغِيضُ الْأَرْحَامُ وَمَا تَزْدَادُ وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ بِمِقْدَارُ And he knows any shortfall in the womb or any 
excess or increase, and everything with him is in due proportion. So this ayah includes whether the embryo is going to be born alive or dead, or whether it will have any deficiency, whether it will not, whether it will be single, whether it will be twins or triplets. All of this is included in his miqdar, in his measurement which he has measured out and decreed. And that also includes the time at which this embryo will be born. Everything. And it is all in accordance with how Allah has decreed it to be. So, the first point is about the actual creation itself, that is decreed. And how you are created, that is decreed. The second type is to give a taqdeer or a decree on the description of the creation, how it will look like, how its condition will be like. So firstly, it's the creation, so to bring it into existence. And then the second one is the description of that particular creation in all its details. So we find people have different skin color, eye color, hair color, different types of intelligence, and then height and weight and so on. There are endless details which we could go on speaking about. Allah Jalla wa ala has decreed it all. And then thirdly, in terms of whether they will be happy or wretched, whether they will be upon guidance or misguidance. As Allah Jalla wa ala says, وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى The one who decrees and guides. So you'll notice in the ayah he says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى The one who creates and then makes taswiya, which is to fashion his creation in its perfect state, or if you like, in its final state. Now the hidayah in the ayah pertains to the creation being guided to that to which they are suited for. So for example, big cats like lions and tigers, they are guided to hunt their prey. Same with eagles and hawks. But then there are other animals that do not hunt. For example, cows and sheep, they are much more docile. They are guided to survive in the more peaceful manner that they survive in. And so likewise, every creation is guided to that which is going to enable them to survive. You also have a different types of guidance in terms of the rightly guided way which would be whether you're on the straight path to Allah Jalla wa ala, or whether you're on the crooked path to Jahannam. And one of the great Mufassireen, Mujahid, he said about the ayah, he guides man to distress or happiness, and he guided the cattle to their pasture. And this is similar to what Allah Jalla wa ala says in Surah Taha, when Musa salam said to Fir'aun, رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى our Rabb is the one who gives everything its creation and then guides it. Meaning to say guides every creation, human, animal, to that which will enable it to survive. So just to recap then, when we say that he has decreed the matters for them, then firstly it means the actual creation. Secondly, it means the details of that creation, so their description. And thirdly, it means guiding them. Now what does guiding them mean? Well, first of all, guiding them to that which will enable them to survive. And then also secondly, guiding them in terms of being rightly guided towards the Sirat al-Mustaqim or not. And that applies to the human and jinn. It does not apply to animals, nor plant life. So from this statement of his, let's take some talking points. First of all, the word Qadr in the Arabic language, it means to prepare something for that which is fitting for it. So for example, if you have a soldier and you prepare this soldier for battle, because the soldier is fitting for the battle. And this is the general linguistic meaning, which we find in Surah Fussilat. وَقَدَّرَ فِيهَا أَقْوَاتَهَا فِي أَرْبَعَةِ أَيَّامٍ سَوَاءً لِلسَّائِلِينَ So he decreed, made taqdeer, in the earth, its provisions, its aqwat, in four epochs, equal for those who ask. Of course, the provisions for the earth are fitting for it. Then as for the more technical shara'i definition, then this is the secret of Allah Jalla wa ala, which no one knows about except he. So neither an angel nor prophet knows about the qadr of Allah. As for its definition, it has been said that it is the prior or antecedent knowledge of Allah Jalla wa ala about things before they happen. And the fact that he writes it down in the Allah al-Mahfuz before he puts it into existence and it is his will which is implemented amongst his creation and finally it is Allah creating what he has willed so in other words this definition is made up of four stages knowledge writing will and creation 
and we need to talk more about these four stages of Qadr in its proper place. But for the time being, we must know that the Qadr of Allah Jalla wa ala has four essential ingredients as we have just mentioned. The second talking point is that when we speak about the Qadr of Allah Jalla wa ala, then we need to restrict ourselves to the text because we are speaking about a matter from the unseen. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا ذُكِرَ الْقَدَرُ فَأَمْسِكُوا When the Qadr of Allah is mentioned, then refrain, meaning refrain from speaking. And without a doubt, that's true because too many people just make mistakes when it comes to the Qadr, as there are far too many misconceptions. In fact, the Hadith says, إِذَا ذُكِرَ أَصْحَابِي فَأَمْسِكُوا وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ الْقَدَرُ فَأَمْسِكُوا وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ النُّجُومُ فَأَمْسِكُوا When my companions are mentioned, then refrain. When the Qadr is mentioned, then refrain. And when the stars are mentioned, then refrain. Because these are three areas people have misconceptions about, and if they speak the wrong words, then it is a grave matter. So speaking about the stars saying, oh well, we were given rain because of such and such a star, as was the common belief amongst the pagans. This is a grave matter. Or speaking about the companions, abusing them, or saying something wrong about them, that will detract from their status. This is a grave matter. And likewise, speaking about the Qadr of Allah Jalla wa ala, about which there are many misconceptions, refrain from speaking about it because it is a grave matter. So these are three sensitive issues mentioned in the Hadith. And from the matters which throw people into misguidance when they speak about the Qadr of Allah is firstly, speaking about the actions of Allah using their own justification. And the problem with that is, if he uses his own justification and his own rationale, to speak about the actions of Allah, then he will be using his own past experience and comparing that to the actions of Allah. Because you cannot speak about certain actions being justified or trying to understand certain actions except by comparing them to what you already know from the actions of the creation. The problem with this, however, is that the perfection of the hikmah of Allah Jalla wa ala, and the perfection of his justification cannot be reached through merely our own intellects. Our intellects have limits and the wisdom of Allah does not have that sort of limit. Thus we find if you speak about the actions of Allah using your own intellect alone, then you're bound to make mistakes. You cannot even begin to imagine how many subtleties there are that you have not taken into account, nor do you have the ability to take into account things you don't know and things you don't know that you don't know. There are so many subtleties. Allah Jalla wa ala grasps them all and we don't even grasp a fraction of them. We need to understand that our intellects are limited in that respect, as amazing as they may be. And we need to bear in mind that our frame of reference is limited. Time, place and understanding. It's all limited because it could be that what Allah Jalla wa ala does, its wisdom shows up in a different time and a different place. Well, we cannot be every place in every time. We're limited to a particular time and space. Allah Jalla wa ala is not. Not only that, but the third reference point, our own understanding and grasp is limited. So it could be that what Allah Jalla wa ala does, its wisdom is right there in front of us, but because of our own lack of comprehension, we cannot see it. So it's like hidden in plain sight. The point being made that our time, place and understanding or comprehension is limited. So our frame of reference is limited. So with a limited frame of reference, you cannot possibly hope to grasp something that is not bound by these limits that you are bound by. This is why we say that those people who speak about the actions of Allah using their own intellects are bound to make mistakes. Now all this does not mean to say that we cannot suggest certain wisdom for the actions of Allah Jalla wa ala. We can certainly make suggestions. For example, why does Allah Jalla wa ala allow sins and kufr to take place on earth when clearly he does not love them? So surely he must want them to happen for a reason, right? We say yes, he must want them to happen for a wisdom. And we can make suggestions as to what this wisdom is. So for example, we can say that without sin and transgression and kufr, it would be impossible to know of the beauty of worship and obedience to Allah Jalla wa ala. Compare the person who spends the night in a nightclub getting drunk and fornicating with 
the one who spends the night in tahajjud, humbling himself to his creator and calling out with humility. Just contrast the two. It is night and day. But if everyone was praying Salat al-Tahajjud, you could not appreciate the beauty of this act of ibadah because everyone else is doing it. It's like if you have a million pounds, you would not appreciate this money if everyone else has a million pounds. But if you have a million pounds and everyone else has ten pounds, then you will surely appreciate the wealth that you have. So that's one. A second point can also be to appreciate how Allah Jalla wa Ala can create two stark opposites obedience and sin, night and day, justice, oppression, and so on. It makes us appreciate His power. Thirdly, if there were no sins, there would be no such thing as enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, which is a righteous action which Allah Jalla wa Ala loves, by which He raises many of His servants in Jannah. Fourthly, we could not have fighting in the way of Allah Jalla wa Ala. Again, an action by which he raises and honors certain servants of his. Fifthly, without sin and transgression, there could be no tawbah. In fact, one scholar said that if tawbah was not the most beloved action to Allah Jalla wa Ala, he would not allow anyone to commit sin. Ponder over that. It's also worthy to note that after tawbah, you can actually become a better person than before you committed the sin. So actually, in a funny way, the sin can make you into a better person if followed with sincere tawbah. Again, all of this could not happen if there was no such thing as sin and transgression. Sixthly, with sin and transgression and kufr, it is a chance to give the kufar some fun and games. Because let's face it, there are no fun and games for them in the hereafter. And so this is what we would call istidraj, when Allah Jalla wa Ala distracts them using the pleasures of this world so they increase in their kufr and that will simply increase them in their punishment and humiliation. So these are just some of the wisdom behind sin and transgression and Allah Jalla wa Ala knows what all the wisdom is. And in his poem At-Ta'iyah speaking about the qadr of Allah Jalla wa Ala Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah sums it up nicely where he says وَأَصْلُ ضَلَالِ الْخَلْقِ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ هو الخوض في فعل الإله بعلة and the root of the misguidance of the creation from every single group is that they spoke about the actions of the Ilah using their own justification or their own rationale. He goes on in the next line. فإنهم لم يفهموا حكمة له فصاروا على نوع من الجاهلية for they did not understand the wisdom for his actions and so they turned into a type from the people of Jahiliyyah. So you would find people asking questions like why did he send a calamity to such and such a people? Why did he take the life of innocent people? Why did he produce cancer in children? Why did he legislate such and such a thing? The questions simply are endless. You won't see the end of them. And you find people doing that all the time. And whenever you see or hear people doing this, then you need to know that they are upon misguidance. They are speaking about something they have no way of fully comprehending. Remember what we said, the Qadr is the secret of Allah Jalla wa Ala. No one knows it. So just to recap, the first point we made here is where people go wrong is that they start applying their own justification to the actions of Allah Jalla wa Ala. And inevitably, when it does not make sense to them, they go astray. And the problem is they're using their limited reference for something which is beyond their limits. And that in and of itself does not make sense. The second matter is one of qiyas or analogy. They make analogy between the actions of Allah and human actions. And the way that works is that they look at the actions of other humans and they decide these are good actions and these are evil actions from the actions of the humans. And then they use that yardstick and apply it to Allah. So they say if these particular actions are good for humans, then they are also good for Allah. And if these particular actions are evil from human, then they are also evil from Allah. And so they start saying things like, if Allah exists, he ought to be doing such and such. And he ought not to be doing such and such. Just as they would say about a human being, a human being 
ought to do this and he ought not to do that. So you see that they are making an analogy between human actions and the actions of Allah. So in terms of what is deemed to be beautiful and what is deemed to be ugly, in terms of what is deemed to be fitting or not fitting, and thirdly in terms of what is deemed to be oppression and justice. These three areas, they take the human actions and apply that same yardstick to the actions of Allah Jalla wa ala. And this is how the Qadariya have been deviated. They are the ones who deny the Qadr of Allah Jalla wa ala. And we say the rule is that Allah Jalla wa ala, his actions and his attributes, just like he himself, his essence, do not resemble that of human beings. As we said, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing of his description and he is the Hera, the seer. If that is known, then it is known that we cannot apply the human yardstick to Allah Jalla wa ala. Rather, we can only apply the human yardstick to humans. Okay, so just to recap again, we have discussed two ways in which people go astray about the Qadr of Allah. The first one was that they use their limited frame of reference and apply it to that which is beyond their limits. Secondly, is that they make analogy between the actions of humans and the actions of Allah. And now we have a third point, which is that they may be reading the books of the people of knowledge whom they trust. However, in some of these books of Qadr, the Sheikh may speak about Qadr using his own ishtihad and hence go wrong. And so the reader would think that his ishtihad, meaning the Sheikh's ishtihad, is actually the Sunnah because the reader trusts the Sheikh so much. The Sunnah about the Qadr of Allah Jalla wa ala is simply what the Quran and the authentic Hadith teach us. We restrict ourselves to that entirely. However, the scholar or the student of knowledge may need to formulate intellectual arguments in order to refute the misguided ones. In a case like this, the intellectual arguments must be such that they back up the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. And so we need to understand there are two phases when it comes to intellectual arguments. If you are establishing something about the Qadr of Allah Jalla wa ala, so affirming something, this can only be done via the text and not through your own personal ishtihad or intellect. But the second phase is if you're refuting someone of misguidance. Now, here you are allowed to use intellectual arguments as long as they back up the authentic Qur'an and the Sunnah. So it is like you're fighting fire with fire, intellect with intellect. You are not affirming anything of the Qadr of Allah using your intellect, rather you are defending the Qadr of Allah using your intellect. So the defense part, meaning the refutation against the people of misguidance in matters of Qadr, this can be done using your intellect as long as your intellectual arguments are in agreement with the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. So they are, if you like, a backup argument. Okay, let us take a few review questions. Question number one. What is the view of Ahl Sunnah when it comes to cause and effect? Question number two. We said that Allah's knowledge can be divided into two types. Explain what these are and anything which results from it. Question number three. We mentioned three problems which people fall into with regards to the Qadr of Allah Jalla wa ala. Explain these three problems. Question four. This idea of using rationality with respect to the Qadr of Allah, we divided it up into two categories. Recall them. 